Uh, so my name is Jim Davis. I work at University of Idaho. I've been doing canola research for almost 30 years, uh, which is a bit frightening when I say it that way. Um, some, uh, Karen asked me to talk a little bit about my experience with pest, pest control. So I'm going to cover a variety of insects. Um, and with that, I'd like to start by saying a word about thresholds, and that word is depends. So generally, our thresholds are pretty rough guidelines. Uh, they're going to be affected by crop price. So if prices are low, you might want to be tolerating a little higher level of damage uh, before you would pay for your insecticide application. When crop prices are higher, uh, then of course you could probably come in and tolerate a little less damage and still pay for that uh, insecticide ap application. So just something to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, so I'm going to start with flea beetles. Um, and so there are a couple of different species, uh, at least of flea beetles that are interested in, that we're interested in, like Angela mentioned. Um, we've got the crucifer flea beetle, which are these guys here up on the left. Um, those are our most common pest uh, in Northern Idaho and Eastern Washington. There's also the striped flea beetle. Uh, and the hop flea beetle. My understanding is that in Montana, you guys are seeing more of the striped flea beetles, which are a little more difficult to control. Apparently the hop flea beetle is not really a pest in canola at this point. Uh, all of my experience has been with the crucifer flea beetle because we don't have uh, striped flea beetles in Northern Idaho and Eastern Washington yet. Uh, so, as Angela mentioned, they overwinter as adults, you know, they hang out in places like fence rows, ditches, uh, forested, air, uh, forested, air, forested areas, and then they fly to your crop uh, when uh, the temperatures get to be around 60 Fahrenheit. Um, and they can fly from field to field, uh, so crop rotation isn't going to be an effective way to control flea beetles. Now, they do prefer mustards and canola, um, mustard weeds, um, as well as canola, but they'll eat other crops, you know, including things like alfalfa. Um, so once you get them in your environment, in the landscape, they're probably there to stay. Uh, our first line of defense in the last few years uh, has been the insecticidal seed treatments. Uh, these have evolved a bit uh, since I started. Uh, you know, we started with imiclopred, uh, uh, but then we got some newer uh, uh, ne uh, neonics, uh, thiomethazam and clothanidin. And these days when you buy canola seed, it's most likely going to be treated with either Helix Vibrance, uh, which is thiomethazam with some fungicides, or it's going to be treated with Prosper Evergol, uh, which is clothanidin with fungicides. These are both pretty effective um, insecticides against the crucifer flea beetle. Uh, more recently, we've seen some new active ingredients come, come on the market. Uh, so floxiflor, which to the best of my knowledge is not currently available in, in the US on canola, uh, but it's marketed as Vesivio, uh, which is the sofloxiflor plus uh, the thiomethazam, so effectively, um, uh, Helix. Uh, newer to the market is Buteo Start, uh, which is effective against both the crucifer and the striped flea beetle. Uh, this is usually added uh, to one of the previous treatments that I talked about. Or uh, Lumiderm, uh, Cyan Tranelaprol, uh, which is effective against the crucifer and the striped flea beetle. Uh, as well as cutworms. So it does offer a little bit of an advantage there. And it is completely different mode of action. It's a group 28 insecticide. Um, so even with the seed treatment, sometimes we will need to have a foliar application, uh, which I'm calling in this case, a rescue foliar ap ap application. Um, in my experience, that's been most commonly seen when we have especially wet springs. Uh, and what I'm thinking is that uh, the moisture, the extra rain is moving some of that seed treatment away from the seedling root, so it's not as, as, as effective. I'm not sure that's exactly what's going on, but it, it does seem to be a trend that I've seen in wet springs. So 
Uh, you need to be out there looking at your canola, if possible, every two to three days when um, uh, after, after it's emerged, when the weather is above 57 degrees, when those flea beetles are going to be active. And the warmer it gets, the more active the flea beetles are going to be. Uh, and then you want to spray at this 20 to 25% uh, defoliation and be ready to spray when you reach, reach that point. Uh, you don't want to wait till you get to, you know, 25% defoliation, call up the crop duster and have them say, oh, sorry, I can't make it for a week. Um, because in a week you might not have a crop left. I also recommend that you use a spreader sticker. Um, that's going to potentially increase the uh, effectiveness of your insecticide. And you also want to check your water pH that you're using to apply the insecticide. Uh, if you have uh, high pH water, say seven and a half to eight or above, that's going to reduce the life of many different insecticides. Uh, so you want to have neutral to slightly acid water. Uh, and you can test your water with like a simple pool or hot tub test kit. Uh, to get an idea of what your water pH is. And so you're seeing your insecticides aren't as effective as you think they should be. Have a look at your water pH. Uh, and there are buffers that you can add to the spray tank that will keep that pH low. Uh, you can also YouTube, uh, do a search on YouTube for flea beetle management and get quite a few uh, good pictures of what some of these different defoliations look like. I've got this picture that Angela showed us from the uh, Canadian Canola, Canola Council to give you an idea of what this 20 to 30% defoliation looks like. And it's really not a lot of defoliation. Um, and it just points out that you need to be out there looking at the crop, uh, you know, pretty closely. And so what, you know, what we're trying to avoid is this kind of stuff where you're starting to get, you know, uh, up beyond 30% uh, defoliation, avoid all this stuff here on, on the right. Um, we also want to avoid having our crop look like this. Um, this was a particular bad flea beetle year uh, with a particular wet spring uh, with a lot of wind and the grower couldn't, couldn't spray. And this points out that flea beetles can be a problem past the cotyledon stage. Uh, so you need to be scouting your, your, your spring canola and your winter canola for that matter, you know, until you're up to at least probably the four leaf stage uh, before you're, you're getting along to the point where you're, you're out of flea beetle dan uh, danger. Uh, so let's not, have an, our, let's not have our crop look, look, look like that. I'm gonna shift gears now a little bit, talk about winter canola and some of the insect pests that we'll see in winter canola uh, start, uh, starting in the late summer or the fall. Of course, flea beetles we've talked about, they can be a problem some years in winter canola establishment. Uh, Clint mentioned having some problem up in the Flathead Valley uh, this year or last year. Um, some years they're not too big of a problem. You know, if you have a situation like this, uh, these guys aren't going to do a lot of damage to those big plants. But uh, we can see some more extreme examples. And, and this is a, a really extreme example. This is some winter canola that we had cut for forage. Um, and uh, we had a lot of flea beetles move in off of some nearby spring canola that had um, uh, started to dry down. And, and you can see because of the forage uh, being removed, we concentrated the flea beetles a bit. Um, so this does, does point out that, you know, we can see some pretty serious flea beetle damage in winter canola as well as the spring canola. So once again, you need to be scout, uh, scouting that crop. Uh, cabbage aphids can be a problem in the fall and winter in winter canola. A lot of times they'll curl up the leaves and you won't be able to see them readily. So you need to have a, a pretty good close look. Uh, if you have a pretty high infestation of cabbage aphids, uh, they can stress the crop in the fall and then it doesn't harden off as well. And you can see some increased winter survival or some decreased winter survival because of cabbage aphid infestations in the fall. Grasshoppers can also be a problem. Uh, Occasionally in northern Idaho and eastern Washington, uh, and I understand that they've been a problem in Montana as well. Uh, and so again, you need to be uh, scouting your fields. When canola is just coming out of the ground, grasshoppers can do a lot of damage in a pretty short period of time. Uh, moving to spring uh, in win winter canola, 
Uh, the primary pest that we're going to be looking at is cabbage seed pod weevil. Uh, like the flea beetle, they overwinter as adults. Uh, they come out in the spring, uh, find the canola, fly to the canola fields, and then the mature females um, are going to be laying eggs in the developing pods. And the larvae are going to hatch inside the pod and then eat the seed from inside the pod. And in northern Idaho, we can see yield losses in winter canola of 25 to 30 percent on a bad uh, cabbage seed pod weevil year. Um, we find that because of the timing of the seed pod weevil, it's primarily a winter canola pest here. The threshold is for spraying is about two to four weevils per 180 degree sweep in a, in a sweep net. Uh, that sounds kind of low, but in reality, there's a lot more flea beetles out there. It's just a little bit hard to get them in the net if you've ever tried to, uh, to sweep insects in a four or five foot tall winter canola crop. Uh, switching gears now again to spring canola. You know, again, our primary pest uh, and, and potentially one of the most devastating is gonna be the flea beetle and uh, the seed treatments are our first line of defense. Um, here's some examples of some larger seedlings uh, with some damage on them. Um, you know, if you're starting to see something that looks like this, you probably need to be getting some insecticide on so we don't end up looking like this picture on the right. Uh, this lower picture is a Brassica juncea canola. Uh, it tends to be a little more tolerant of feeding damage. The feeding damage looks a little different. Uh, so a situation like this really isn't too bad on a Brassica Gensia canola. Uh, but if you're getting to this point, you better start uh, to think, be thinking about doing, doing some spraying. Uh, our, our common varieties uh, of canola, and most of probably what you guys are growing in Montana, are, the, are, are Brassica napus which are the more sensitive varieties uh, to flea beetle damage. Uh, we did a little flea beetle study in Moscow over a period of three years re recently uh, to look at the foliar application of insecticides uh, across some different planting dates. Uh, th five different cultivars, all the seed was treated with helix fibrance. Uh, we had three seeding dates. We had sprayed and unsprayed. And I sprayed early about 15, maybe 20% defoliation, which worked out to be about three to four weeks after seeding. This was funded by the Idaho Oil Seed Commission. Um, and as we look at the seeding dates, the first thing that, that you'll notice if you look at the seed yield over here on the right is that when we delay seeding uh, after our optimum in Northern Idaho, which is the end of April to 1st of May, we see a huge yield uh, hit. So we're going from nearly 2,500 pounds averaged over three years down to 1,000 pounds if we delay seeding uh, roughly four, four weeks. You look at the flea beetle damage, this is on a scale of one to nine where nine is no damage, so a larger number is bigger. You can see at least in these years that we avoided a little bit of the flea beetle damage by seeding early or by seeding late. Uh, but again, seeding late ha has a huge cost in, in, in yield uh, not related to the flea beetle damage. And so we're not going to advocate that, that you try to, at least in Northern Idaho, Eastern Washington, that you try to, to uh, uh, manipulate flea beetle damage by changing your seeding date. Uh, but the real story here is looking at, at, the, at the effect of an insecticide spray over, over the top. If you look at the flea beetle damage score, you can see we increased from a score of seven, which isn't terrible on a scale of one to nine, uh, up to a score of seven and a half by spraying. So we did reduce the damage a bit uh, with a full air spray. Uh, and you can see that averaged over the three years and, and, and the three different planting dates, we actually increased our yield uh, with a full air spray of 200, by 212 pounds per acre. Now, some seeding dates and years, it was considerably more than this. Uh, some seeding dates and years, it was a bit less. Um, but in most cases, if you're seeing some flea beetle damage out there, it's probably going to pay you to put on an insecticide. Uh, so again, that just points out that you need to be out there looking at your crop, uh, looking at the flea beetle damage. Um, Angela mentioned cutworms. We do see those in northern Idaho. 
uh, in eastern Washington. Again, they're pretty patchy, uh, but they can be super devastating um, in, in some situations. Uh, cutworms are nocturnal, um, which makes them a little difficult to notice or control, but you need to be scouting pretty regularly at crop emergence. Uh, and, and what you're going to see in the case of cutworms is an area where you had plants, you're going to notice that you don't have plants. Um, so it's sort of like the invasion of the body snatchers, uh, but the plants will be disappearing. Um, and there are some foliar insecticides available, but because the cutworms are nocturnal and they're in the soil during the day, you need to be spraying in the late evening at night or very early in the morning before sunrise to have the best control if you're using a foliar insecticide. And as I mentioned earlier, the new uh, product Lumiderm is labeled for cutworm uh, control. And so if cutworms are a, a regular problem in your area or on your farm, adding the Lumiderm seed treatment uh, to your canola seed would probably be uh, worthwhile. Uh, we also occasionally see diamondback moth uh, in northern Idaho. Typically, it's been once in every five to six years uh, we'll see an infestation that is large enough to think about spraying. Uh, the moths are pretty small. You'll see them flitting about as you move through the, through the field. When they open their wings, they look white. Uh, but it's really the larvae that do the damage, these really small worms here on the pod. In our area, what we see is they'll come in during flowering and they actually eat the flower buds before the flowers open. And so they don't have a chance to produce pods. Um, another way to pick out uh, the uh, diamondback moth larva is that, to note that they spin webs. And so uh, if you walk through the crop, uh, you'll knock them off the plant and they'll hang by webs, kind of like a spider. Or if you've been driving your tractor through the fields, putting down a, a, a herbicide, you might see the larva uh, hanging uh, from your tractor from their webs. The threshold is about 10 to 15 larva per square foot or about 10 larva per plant. Sometimes we'll also see blister beetles. These are, you know, tend to be large black iridescent beetles. Uh, they can be pretty alarming because they come in in congregations to mate. Uh, and uh, you can actually hear them chewing. Uh, they, they can do a lot of damage. But because they're typically in, in these congregations in small areas, uh, it's usually not something that you have to spray for. Uh, and they disperse pretty rapidly as soon as they mate. Um, it is worth keeping your eye on them, though, because every once in a while we'll see populations uh, in certain years large enough where you might want to go in and do some spot spraying uh, because they can do a lot of damage in a pretty short period of time. Uh, we also have cabbage seed pod weevils, as I mentioned, in winter canola. And these tend not to be much of a problem in spring canola, at least in Northern Idaho and, uh, and Eastern Washington uh, because of our timing. Uh, and so if you look at this graph, basically here on the y-axis, what we're looking at is the number of adult weevils caught in a trap uh, during the spring and summer. So they overwinter as adults, the mature females come out in April, they fly to your canola fields, uh, they usually tend to get there during peak bloom of the winter canola. Uh, they'll lay their eggs and then they die. So the population falls off. Meanwhile, the larvae are in the winter canola pods eating the seed. Uh, they mature and they pupate and then they emerge later in the summer. And these weevils are not mature. And so they're not going to lay eggs until the next season. So typically when we've got our spring canola that is blooming in late June or July and then producing pods in mid-July, the cabbage seed pod weevil aren't going to be a problem. They will feed a little bit uh, as, as adults, but, but unless the populations are super high, that's not going to be an issue. Uh, and so we can usually ignore them. Although if you do have to come in and spray for another pest during this time and you knock off some of those cabbage seed pod weevils, that's just fewer of them that are going to be around to hit the winter canola the next year. Uh, one big pest uh, late season uh, for us pretty commonly is the cabbage aphid. Uh, they, they, they congregate on, on the growing points uh, of the flower stalks. Um, sometimes they can look pretty nasty. You get these big colonies on, on, the, uh, on the flower stalks. 
A uh, typical threshold would be for one in five flower stalks infested. Uh, so about 20% of the flower stalks uh, infested. Sometimes it's not this obvious. Uh, sometimes you just have just a few of the aphids in among the flower buds. So you can't see them unless you go in and look really closely. But a good sign to look for is the tip of the flower stalk bending over a bit and turning purple. I get a little deformation from just a few aphids aphids, feed, uh, aphids feeding. And even if the colonies are quite small, if you're up into that you know, 20% zone of the stalks infested, you're gonna wanna spray because uh, they do reproduce fast. Here's a little closer look at them. Uh, they're a bit on the disgusting side. Uh, and here's a, a look at, at a field that's, that's probably reached that threshold for spraying. We've probably got well over 20% of the stalks with some aphids on them. There's a few other pests that sometimes we see in, in canola in Idaho. We'll occasionally see uh, ligus bugs and we'll also see thrips or actually what we'll see is the pod curling caused by the thrips. Typically these aren't gonna cause uh, economic damage uh, and, and, and you don't have to worry about uh, ligus bugs and thrips, at least in Northern Idaho, uh, Eastern Washington. There's, if you do have to spray for some of these things, there's a wide variety of insecticides that are labeled. I've not looked at the labels real recently to know if everything here is current, but commonly uh, growers in our area are spraying the Lambda Cyhalothrin, which is like Warrior II or Grizzly. Uh, there's a number of products available or by Finthrin, uh, which is Capture or again, some um, uh, generic products. Of course, we do have some beneficial insects in, in canola. And so if you've not reached these thresholds that I've talked about for spraying, uh, it's okay to kind of hold off on the insecticide and let these beneficials like lace wings and ladybugs go ahead and, and do some of the work for, work for you. Uh, the lace wings are, are, are very aggressive against, uh, against aphids and, late, and ladybugs. Here are some eggs on the other side of the leaf. And here are the larvae of the ladybugs, which you might not be familiar with. Uh, these guys are aphid eating machines. And so if you can let them do some of the work for you, uh, they don't charge anything. And of course, we have bees in our canola. Uh, both honeybees commercially, as well as a lot of different wild species of bees that are important pollinators. Uh, and so if you do have to spray during flowering time for cabbage seed pod weevil, or you have an early infestation of aphids, uh, if you've got beekeepers in your area or hives near your field, it's a good idea to contact uh, the beekeeper. And then you also want to try to spray when the bees aren't active. So that's gonna be very early in the morning or, or late in the evening. Um, I've had best luck avoiding bees by, by, by spraying late in the evening, because uh, I have a hard time getting up in the morning before bees do. Uh, they get going uh, pretty much right at sunup as soon as it warm, warm, warms up a bit. Uh, so with that, uh, that's all I've got for you guys uh, now. I know I went through a lot of information in pretty short order, uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who is going to talk a little bit about some specific uh, situations in Montana where he has more experience than I do. And then when Matt's done, hopefully we'll have a little time for some questions. But uh, I think I know a lot of you in the room today. My name is Matt Smith. I'm with BASF. I am an agronomist out in eastern Montana and I cover Northwest North Dakota as well. So throughout the year, I service a little north of 300,000 acres of uh, seed sales that I'm responsible for. So we're going to talk a little bit more about flea beetles today because uh, uh, it's definitely the, the, the number one phone call I get uh, in the spring and throughout the year even, and uh, a very hot button issue uh, for the canola grower. You can go to the next slide, Karen. So we'll just, a lot of this has already been said and that's great, but uh, like I said, it, it's good to go over some of this stuff uh, twice, but talk about scouting for flea beetles in Montana. We'll talk about uh, some of the populations of the specific species I've been observing, seed treatments, some cultural IPM stuff, and uh, 
some research needs going forward. Next slide, please. So again, a lot of this has already been talked about today, uh, your thresholds, things like that. But what I wanted to, to take a little deeper dive on, and Angela covered this as well, is, is the populations of the specific species. So going back 10, 12 years, we used to just group everything as flea beetles. But as Angela said, uh, we're starting to notice more of uh, the stripe variety. Uh, to, to the point where it used to be primarily crucifer. And in the state of Montana, I should back up a little bit there. We're still seeing primarily crucifer, but uh, when I'm hooping fields in spring and things like that, I'm starting to see more striped. And, and excuse me if I, I'm missing anything from this part of the, the world out in Western Montana. I don't know what you guys are seeing out here, but uh, uh, striped are more prevalent. And then uh, again, areas in North Dakota I cover that are been canola production for a number of years, uh, uh, that historic kind of mature canola acre, the populations have shifted to dominant to striped. And what the stripe do, uh, they are more tolerant to the neonics, which is your base uh, insecticide seed treatment package on, on most canola that you'd grow. Uh, they do tend to feed on the stem more, and they are a little more aggressive in the spring. They come out earlier. So you'll see your striped come out earlier then your crucifer, there'll be a little period where they kind of interact and, and, uh, and, and go from there. So when you're scouting, when you're hooping those fields, as Angela showed you to do, uh, don't just look for the little black bugs. Look and, look and see a little closer there because it is kind of hard to miss when you're looking to, to differentiate between those two species. Seed treatment tables, this is already talked about. Again, you buy a bag of canola seed your base insecticide package is going to be a neonic group four. So your thymus oxins, clothanidins, commercial names, Helix, and Prosper, things like that. And for the most part, the state of Montana, uh, those are still working. So here's some data out of Canada, a picture out of Canada uh, showing that they do still work. We've got low to moderate populations uh, of, of crucifers or just flea beetles in general. Did I screw something up? Yep. Just, you just notice, I guess in the past, I really wasn't looking for them, but until you've seen some more of this information come out of Canada, North Dakota, you start looking for them more and they are there. Sheridan County, Daniels County, for sure. On your farm, Charlie, all over. Yep. <laughs> so, your neonics, your base, your base uh, insecticide package. That's that's what you're going to get. We've also got some add-on products: our lumiderms, our fortenzas, our buteo starts, and and we've got some some. Uh, heavier populations of flea beetles. If, we, if, if we're seeing a lot of striped flea beetles, uh, those diamides, butanolides, uh, they are more lethal. They've got quicker knockdown than just a straight neonic. So there are situations uh, where those come into play. So this is Lumiderm here. And those products, Lumiderm, et cetera, et cetera, are always gonna be an add-on to that neonic. So when you're looking at research, Make sure you differentiate between that because some of the research I've seen will show a straight 150 gram rate of lumiderm, which is, isn't commercially available. What you're gonna get is a 400 gram rate of clothianidin and a 400 gram rate of lumiderm. The buteo, uh, which is offered by DeKalb, would be, would be similar. So this is a little decision tree I came up with here because really decision time is now, all your canola seed is treated upstream. So it's not something you treat yourself in the spring or take to the seed house and get treated. Uh, you've got to order that now because those decisions are being made by the manufacturers. Certain hybrids may come with the top up, certain hybrids may, may, may not come with it. So that's a discussion you want to have with your seed dealer. So decision time is now, you're going to make that decision. There's just a few things to go over. You've got to traditionally, a light population, flea beetles, 
stick with that group four. Uh, if you're okay, and I should have checked both boxes on this one. If you're okay with timely scouting in spring, uh, uh, stick with the group four, but realize if you top it up to something like a Lumiderm, that's not always gonna, gonna save your butt. So you may still have to spray. We've got heavy populations coming in. They're good flyers. Uh, they've got to eat to die. So keep that in mind as well. And some other things here, you can kind of look for uh, where you would, would go with one or the other, but those decisions got to be made. You got to talk to your dealer, your consultant, whoever's making those decisions for you. Now we're getting towards the end of the seed selling season and, and things kind of go from there. So cultural IPM with flea beetles, Angela kind of touched on this as well. To me, it's just as important uh, as far as relying on those insecticides. So now I'm painting with a broad brush here. I can't get that thing off, but in general, and again, this is in general, growers in Montana, and, and I should on the first one here say growers in the US, because when we were coming out with unit-based packaging, I think the average based on our surveys, that back when it was pounds that growers were seeding was like 4.1 or 4.2 pounds. And I would say Montana growers tend to be even lower than that, probably in the mid to high threes. Uh, we also plan tend to seed a little earlier in areas and sometimes we're forced to do this by our crop insurance states and we'll talk about that in my last slide some changes that maybe we need to be there but seeding lower rates and seeding earlier in regards to flea beetles don't always go uh, that well together and montana grower a lot of times we're seeding large acres uh, we're spread out farms are bigger we might have a field of canola that's six, seven miles on another farm somewhere else. And uh, that, that limits us on scouting, but, but we still need to do it sometimes. And no-till, minimum till, this one's kind of a, a double-edged sword. So as Dale mentioned, the black dirt, uh, we'll get more activity there. The flea beetles like that more, but uh, minimum till typically those soils are a little cooler. Uh, and Angela touched on that. I'd like to see if you're no-till still pushing that that seeding temperature up to 50 degrees versus just going off a date on the calendar. You're gonna see better emergence. The faster that plant grows, the faster it's gonna beat the flea beetles. So all these factor in to flea beetle pressure and management. What we wanna do, where, where do we want that to take us? Uh, we wanna stay within the curve here. And so every canola hybrid is gonna have a little curve we deal with where we wanna be as far as our populations. So this was done in Minot last year, L233P, some replicated data and a show plot we had. And we had different plots of different seeds uh, per square foot. So you can see here, this is seeds, this is an emergence, but this was planted at the end of May. So it, we were batting pretty close to our germ rate as far as emergence. So that give you kind of an idea there of how many actually came out of the ground. But as Angela touched on, we want to have five to eight plants per square foot go through the combine. So to do that, we've got to be in that eight to 10 seeds per square foot range to be in that curve and that sweet spot where we want to be. So that's something to keep in mind as well. We got a lot of flea beetles if we're seeding early, they're knocking that stand down. 27 cent canola. I just went off the price at ADM Belva today for September delivery. The stakes are a lot higher if we reduce that stand. And, and there's multiple reasons for that, but flea beetles are definitely uh, uh, something that, that'll do that. And I get questions at harvest a lot of times of, well, it looked like I had 2,500 pound canola and I only got 1,800 pounds. And there's, again, there's a lot of reasons that, that could go into that. But the first question I ask is how many plants actually went through that combine was your stand optimal? And five plants per square foot doesn't look a whole lot different than 10 if you're driving down the road. Two does. You can definitely start to see some differences as you get down there. But in that six to 10 plant range, uh, uh, that's tough to visually see just, just driving by. So that's something you want to watch going forward as well. So we've talked about this a little bit today too. 
we need more research in Montana. And flea beetle population monitoring, as Charlie mentioned, uh, the only way we're going to really tell what those populations are doing is getting the sticky traps out there and, and seeing what's flying through them. And, and that, that'd be somewhere where we'd start with research in the state of Montana, similar to what North Dakota is doing in Canada as well. Seeding rate research, I know some of that's been done in the past, seeding date research. And we talked about insurance dates. We've got it April 15th to a May 15th, I believe, insurance planning range for the whole state. Well, that might work in Kalispell, but that doesn't work in Plentywood. So we need to use some of this research to, to get to more of a North Dakota model where we've got four different zones for insurance planning dates. And, and that'll get more growers growing canola. That's a conversation I have every year. We get to May 15th, growers want to do canola, but then they don't seed it because we've hit that insurance date. When in reality, in parts of Montana that I cover, we could easily uh, go up to June 1st on a seeding date, no problem. The insurance states haven't kept up with the genetics, some of these canola hybrids. So they handle heat much better than they, than they have in the past. So when you guys are meeting as an association, that, that's something to talk about. Flea beetles kind of ties into all this. That's all I got. Thank you. <laughs>